back up with lesson number 10, Grieving the Holy Spirit. We've been here for about four weeks now. Uh, we've already dealt with the subject of how we can grieve the Spirit of God by lying. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing with the sin of um, anger. And so we want to continue to look at this sin. Um, the scripture says it's not a sin to be angry, but we can be, we can sin when we allow anger to control us. And so if you have your Bibles tonight, turn with us to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. And in particular, we'll be dealing with the sin of anger. And so if you have your hymn books, there should be a hymn that's already turned in your book, I Am Dying, O Lord. We're going to sing that hymn, and then we'll come back with a brief word of prayer. And then we'll move into lesson number 10, Grieving the Holy Spirit, uh, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. But let's sing verse 1, 2, and 4 of I Am Dying, O Lord. And then we'll come back with prayer and start into the lesson. I am dying, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. And be closer drawn to thee. Verse 2. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost and dying. Verse 4, there are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There of heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, near, O oh blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, near, O oh blessed Lord, to thy precious bleed inside. Draw Draw me nearer, near, O oh blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, near, O oh blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Amen. I am thine, O Lord. Father, we come, we, we want to thank you that we can draw near to you through the blood of Jesus Christ. The scripture says we can boldly come before the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And as we draw near, Lord, we draw near to say thank you. Thank you for life, health, and strength. Thank you for the salvation and the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Lord God, that we can come before you and just, just to worship you, the true and living God. And God, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth, that my soul may make his boast in the Lord, so that the humble will hear of it, and be glad. Yes. And we're here to magnify you, Lord. We're here yes. to exalt your name. Yes. We're here to tell the world that Jesus is the Christ, yes. that he is the son of the living God, yes. that he came down through 42 generations, yes. and he went to the cross as a substitute, as a ransom for sins. Yes. 
He was the Lamb of God who came to take away our sins and who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so, God, we come asking that you would search our hearts and forgive our sins, Lord. For against the Lord have we sinned and done evil in your sight. But your word tells us if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, God, we thank you for the purifying, cleansing blood of Jesus that can wash us whiter than snow. We pray, God, tonight that you would strengthen our mortal bodies so that where, where we're weak, may your strength be made perfect. Yes. And then, God, we pray that you would be with us as we open up the word, yes. because heaven and earth will pass away someday. Yes, Lord. But you said your word will remain forever. Yes. So, God, it will behoove us to know what your word says. Yes. And after knowing what it says, help us to do what it says. Yes. We ask this in Jesus name. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you all again, brothers and sisters, for coming out tonight as we continue to look at lesson number 10, Grieving the Holy Spirit. And we've discovered that the moment we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that the Spirit of God sealed us until the day of redemption and that the Spirit of Christ lives within us. And so therefore, uh, the Spirit uh, dwells in us. And we can grieve the spirit. We can make the spirit sad by the way that we live. And so the main ideal, again, of the lesson, lesson 10, is that the Holy Spirit loves you, but grieves over your sin. And so he loves you, but he grieves. He's made to be sad when we sin against God. The question to explore is how do I grieve the Holy Spirit? And that's what we've been looking at in Ephesians chapter 4, 25 to 32. It talks about the ways that the Christian believer can grieve the Spirit of God. And then the teaching aim of this lesson is to lead adults to understand that they can avoid grieving the Holy Spirit when they are kind and compassionate to others. And so the goal of this lesson is to get you uh, to have you avoid grieving God's spirit by the way you treat other Christians. Um, Brother Larry alluded to when we first started this lesson that how we can grieve, we can be grieved because the spirit of God lives in me and he also lives in you. And so if you sin against me, it grieves the spirit of God that lives in me. Or the opposite, if I sin against you, the Spirit of God is made to be grieved in you because we are one another's brothers and sisters. And so one of the first things we talked about in this lesson is that one of the sins that grieve the Spirit of God is lying. Uh, we talked about we ought to speak the truth to one another and stop lying. Um, Paul, in, in the book of Ephesians, when he gets to um, chapter 4, now chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul is dealing with the doctrinal beliefs of the Christian, what Christ has done for us. Um, and then when he gets to chapter 4, he says, now this is how you are to live out your Christian faith. This is how you are to behave as a Christian in the world. This is how you are to behave toward one another. And so... This is what he says here, if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 17. Paul is letting us know that we are new creations in Christ. Old things are passing away, all things are becoming new for the Christian. And so notice what he tells us in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. When Paul uses the word walk, he's talking about life, lifestyle, the way you live. He said, you are no longer to live like the rest of the unsaved world. When he talks about the Gentiles, he says, now you are no longer to, to walk or to live out your life as a Christian 
like the rest of the Gentiles walk, who are what futility in their mind. So their minds are affected. The unbeliever um, has a mind that doesn't serve God. Remember what he tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, I urge you, I plead with you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your reasonable form of worship. He says in verse 2 of Romans chapter 12, and do not be conformed to this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may know what God's will is, which is what good, perfect, and pleasing. And so Paul says the reason why the, the, the Gentile world, the unsaved world, cannot what uh, please God, cannot worship God or live for God, he said because their minds are futile having their what understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. In other words, the life of Christ does not live in the unbeliever. The, the life of Christ only lives in the one who has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. So you wonder why people who are not saved do what they do, think the way they think, talk the way they talk, because they don't have the mind of Christ. They don't have the life of Christ dwelling in them. So never expect a non-believer to act like a Christian. And, and, it just, and, we just, and it just makes us angry when we go around non-Christians and hear the way they talk. Well, you shouldn't expect nothing uh, other than they don't know God. And you want them to stop cussing. They don't know God. They don't know nothing about um, letting no unwholesome word come, come out of your mouth because that's, that's the nature of an unsaved man. He doesn't have the mind of Christ. He does not have the nature of Christ. So therefore, he only going to speak what he knows and what he's heard and what he's learned. Having their what understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of what? The ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. Ignorance in them and their hearts have been blinded by Satan. Look at verse 19, who being past feeling have, have, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all un uncleanness and unrighteousness. In other words, they have given themselves over to sin. He says they've given themselves over to lewdness, talking about sexual sins, adultery, fornication. Um, greediness, all types of sin they've given themselves over to because their minds are dark and they don't have the what life of God in them. But notice here's the transitional statement. He says, now, this is, this is how the, the unbelieving world lives. This is how the Gentiles who don't know God live. He talks about that in what, verses 17 through what, 19. Now he contrasts you as a child of God who now knows God. Look what he says in verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ if indeed you have heard him and have what been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now notice what he's telling the Christian that you put off concerning your former conduct. Now, if you want to know what your form of conduct is, go back to verses 17 through what? 20 um, through 19. He says, in your form of conduct, you had fertility of your mind. Your understanding was darkened. You had been alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that was in you. You were what? Past feelings and having have given themselves over to what? Lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That was your former life before Christ. You was a sinner. And you did sinful things that displeased God. But notice here's the transition. But you have not so learned Christ. Now, if you read the Bible, you know the, you know the life of Christ. You know the mind of Christ. You know how Christ lived. You know how Christ forgave, how he loved, how he sacrificed, how he died for others. He says... But you have not so learned Christ. In other words, Christ was not what we read in verse 17 through what? 19. 
as the truth is in Jesus. Now, this is what you're to do as a Christian. Verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And being what renewed in the spirit of your mind. Y'all see it? So those, those are things that you have to do. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to renew your mind. Well, how do you allow the Holy Spirit to renew your mind? You pray. What else? Be around people that. Be around other Christians. What else? You have to accept Christ into your life. Okay, you accept Christ. And then you have to be obedient to the word. And be obedient to the word. So that was the main point I was going to get at, that you have to, what, read the word of God and obey the word. Then you, you discover that the old things that you used to do, you don't want to do no more, right? So he's saying here, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you, what, put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You are to put on the new man. You're not to live like the rest of the Gentile world, Paul is saying. You have been made new by the spirit of God. You are to put on the newness of life. Now, brothers and sisters, just, just picture yourself. You've been working all day in the hot sun. You've been sweating. Uh, you've either been cutting grass or you've been working in an environment now you're hot, you're sweaty, you're musty, you're stinky. And the first thing you want to do when you get home is to take off them dirty clothes, get in the shower, and get cleaned up, right? You don't want to walk all the way all around in that dirt and that filth and that stink and that must. You want to take off the old so that you can put on the new. You know, you go to the shower first, you get showered up. Now you want to put on what, some clean clothes. You don't go put on the same stinking clothes you just took off. That would be what? Defeating the purpose, Defeating the purpose of taking a bath. Well, likewise, now that you have been born of the Spirit of God, the old sinful desires, they're still there. They still want you to perform in the old sinful lifestyle. But you have to make a decision now. Do I obey the spirit? Do I obey my flesh? And Paul is saying here that we are to put on the new man, which was created according to God. So God has made you a new creation. Second Corinthians 5, 17 again says, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new, right? So he's challenging us to put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, how do I know I'm walking in the new man or in the new life or in the power of the spirit? That's what we find in verse 25. Therefore, put away lying because the old man used to lie. <laughs> right? So the new man is not to be a liar. And so that's what, it, that's what Paul is saying here, that we ought to put off, we ought to take off, and then we ought to what, replace something new, and it's in the old place. So you ought to put off lying. It says more than simply telling direct falsehoods, Lying also includes exaggeration. Y'all know what exaggeration is, right? Yeah. You caught a fish like this, but by the time you tell it, it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lie. Right? That's lying. So not only just telling a blatant, blatant out, straight out lie, when you exaggerate. Right? Man, I scored 50 points on him. Man, I have I mean, I mean, man, you only scored 12. <laughs> well, it felt like 50. Well, no, that's lying. You know what you did. And so Paul is saying here that it's not just simply lying, but when you exaggerate and what add fabrication to something that is true. Yeah, you caught a fish. That's true. But you didn't catch no 12-pound, 6-ounce fish. 
We saw it when you pulled it out of the water. I think it was about three pounds, six ounces, right? Paul said, when you even tell the truth and you exaggerate, that's lying. So you ought to put away lying. Also, he says, cheating or making foolish promises. No, you promise somebody something. You said you're going to be there. You said you're going to do something, but you don't do it. That's lying. The Bible says, let your yes be what? And your no be? Everything else is of the devil, right? He said, you ain't got to, you know, I swear to God, I, I promise I'll be there on my mama's grave on a sack of Bibles. <laughs> you're either going to keep your word or you're not going to keep your word. Don't lie. You know, I've been having people tell me for 18 years, I'm coming to your church and hear you preach one Sunday. People have been telling me that for 18 years. Watch me. One of these days I'm going to sneak in on you. It ain't going to be no sneak in, okay. right? you finally going to keep your word, uh-huh. right? I heard people say, well, I'm coming back. Ooh. Well, the, the pandemic kept me away for the first four years, but I'm coming back. And when they say that, they already know they're not coming back. Okay. Why do we always seem to think we have to lie to the preacher, mm-hmm. right? We got impressed to preach. I'm coming back. You can count on me. I'll be there. But watch, let it rain. (laughs) Does does rain do something to Christians? Do do y'all melt when it rain? Or is do your hair go bad when it rain? Or I mean, what's what's up with Christians and rain? All it needs is a little water falling from the sky, and Christians think they're gonna melt. And so we exaggerate. We make things bigger and larger than what we say they are. That's called lying. Then when we say we're going to do something and we don't do it, that's also called lying. And then to gain somebody's confidence, we lie. You say that you're going to do something and you gain that person's confidence. And then, then you don't follow through. That's lying. You know, we have um, guidelines for our church leaders here. And every time someone joins a ministry, we give them the guidelines. The guidelines is, first of all, you must be a Christian uh, in order to serve in ministry at the church. Second of all, you must attend worship service when you have an opportunity. Third, you must also be a growing Christian committed to coming to Bible studies and to what? Sunday school when when you are able to. And then we say, are you willing to do those things? Oh, yeah, you can count on me, Doc. I'll be there. And then the majority of the church don't even show up for Bible study. Don't show up for Sunday school. Hit and miss on morning worship. In other words, we will say anything to gain the confidence of someone, but then the commitment lags. And that's called lying. <laughs> and, and we tend to think that lying is okay in church, but I can't lie to my boss. Because if the boss catches me lying, he can either write me up or fire me. But we lie to God. We make commitments to God. We, we come up here and we do our recommitments, our rededications, and I'm going to do better in this area. Please pray for me. I want to do better. And within a week, <laughs> we're back to doing all that we were doing before we came and made a commitment to God. The Bible says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Everything else is of the evil one, right? And so Paul says, therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Why? For we are members of one another. We have, what we do or don't do affect everyone. Imagine being a part of a sports team, the Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Mavericks, since we're in Texas, the Houston um, whatever they are, Texans. Imagine 
uh, Dak Prescott. He comes to practice, but he don't show up at the game. You don't think that would affect the Cowboys on the field, right? Now, just think about you're part of a team too, right? You're part of God's team. And in particular, you're part of St. Paul's team. And every member has a part to play. Dak is the quarterback. C.D. Lamb is the what wide receiver. And I don't know who the running back going to be this year, but since they Zeke. let, yeah, Zeke may be coming back. They, I think they're probably going to give him a dollar contract and let him retire as a cowboy. But here's the point that I'm making. Every player on the cowboy team has a responsibility and they have a commitment to the team. Do you see yourself as a team player, a team member, so that when you're not available to come, do you ever pick up the phone and say, I can't come, I'm sick, I'm at work. I broke my leg. We know, we, we, there, in other words, there's accountability with the team. Imagine, again, Dak don't call, he don't show. Now, Dak could be in a wreck, he could be in the hospital. He could have had an extreme emergency with family. And so Dak being a responsible quarterback, the leader of the Dallas Cowboy football team, he picks up the call, the phone and calls Coach McCarthy, coach, I'm going to be late for practice or late for the game. Um, I just got a phone call that my mother passed away. Uh, I, I was just in a car wreck, and I'm on my way to the hospital. Okay, Dak, man, I greatly appreciate it. Whatever we can do as your coach and as your team, let us know what we can do. We'll be up there as soon as we can. Do you... Do you do that when you miss church on Sundays? <laughs> do you pick up the phone and call your responsible um, head of your uh, department and say, um, I can't make it today, I'm at work, or I'm going to be at work tomorrow, so I'm calling you in advance? See, you're part of the team. The Bible says every member should do their part. Now, now here's the thing that we uh, should look at. Because he was, he's talking about being mature, growing in love. Look at, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and we're talking about God giving us gifts in Ephesians chapter what 4, starting with verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So when you got saved, God gave you a grace gift. It was something you didn't earn. It wasn't something you went to school to, to learn. God gifted you with a spiritual gift, and you are to employ that gift. Now look at some of the gifts that God gave to the church, starting with verse 11. And he, talking about Christ, gave some to be apostles. Now those are the church founders. Um, the, the original 12 apostles were chosen by Jesus Christ himself. They were eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Not only did he give what apostles, but he gave some to be prophets. Those are the ones who spoke a prophetic word, but also in the new age, um, God gave them a direct revelation to the church. Some he gave to be what evangelists. Those evangelists are those who what who primarily preached the gospel to the unsaved, like Billy Graham was, right? So he had a primary message. It's the message is that God loves you. He sent Christ to die for you. Would you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? The message of the good news is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so the evangelist is needed in the body of Christ, and their primary goal is to tell the unbelieved believer that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and he wants you to be saved. And then he says, not only that, but he gave what? Pastors and teachers. He gave spiritual leaders to what? And look at, look at their primary responsibility. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. So all these gifts were given to individuals in the church to help build up. The word edify means to build up, means to strengthen, right? So every member has a gift. And every member is to be using their gifts to what? Build up the entire church body. Y'all see that? 
And what is the sole purpose of edifying the body of Christ using your gifts? Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith, that is the faith in Jesus Christ, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or mature person, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we, the church, the body of Christ, should no longer be the longer children, that is in our understanding, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. In other words, there are false teachers that's out there ready to deceive you. He called them what? Crafty, deceiving trickery of men. That's why it's so important to be up under pastoral leadership and to be accountable to the church body so that you don't be floating around from this church to that church to this church and that church, listening to this preacher, that preacher, and every time something new comes around the Christian community, you jumping over there, they falling out over there, they, they twisting and flipping over there, and you run over there because you say, that's the move of God over there. They're not doing that at my church, so that must be the place to be. And so the Bible says the only way that you're going to become centered in the church and in the body of Christ, that you line yourself up on the pastor teacher leadership studying the word of God, growing in faith, growing in love, growing in Christian maturity, using your spiritual gifts to help build up the rest of the body of Christ so that you won't be what tricked by men with their cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But notice here in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love that you may grow up in all things into him who is the what head from whom the whole body, that is the body of Christ, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. In other words, what the giftedness that you got, it helps supply strength to the rest of the body. See, your, your whole body, you have a body. And when you eat and when you put in nourishment, when you drink, when you exercise, it nourishes your whole body, right? Your food goes in your mouth, and in your stomach, but it also, what, it strengthens the whole entire body. Well, likewise, you are to be here to help edify the entire body. Whatever your gift is, you are to be here to employ it for the rest of the body. You say, well, they can do without me. Somebody else can take my spot. God didn't design nobody to take your spot. You're uniquely designed by God, gifted by God to do what God has ordained you to do. And so if we would only realize, can't nobody do what I do. God gifted me to do what I do. Can't nobody do it like me because ain't nobody me but me. You have to see you're needed at the church just like you're needed at the job. Now, it, it really behooves me to when I, when I see people getting up at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning to go to jobs, but they can't get up at 7 or 8 o'clock to come to church. The same alarm on their phone that they set to go to work they won't set on Sunday to come to church because they say, well, I, I'm not ne really needed. My giftedness is really not necessary to help build up that church. And when you're not here exercising your gift, the whole body suffers because there is a part that you play that is no longer available to the body. And so that's what Paul is saying. And he's calling for a walk of unity among the believers. And he says, now you are to put away the old way of thinking and put on the new. Then he says, and then this is what you do to see that you're walking in the newness of the spirit, put away lying. Now, now we talked about lying, but then he goes on to say, look at verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, there is a limitation on your anger. It should be a limitation. 
He says, be angry, but do not sin. Now, we talked about uh, there's a time to be angry. We talked about when Potiphar's wife in Genesis 39 was told that Joseph tried to rape her. He was angry and he threw Joseph in prison. We talked about um, displaced anger. Cain was angry at God, but he took it out on his brother Abel and killed him. The Bible says you can be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give a foothold to the devil. Do you not know one of the meekest men in the Bible had an anger problem? Do y'all know who the Bible describes as being one of the, the meekest men on the earth? Let's go to Exodus. Exodus. And, and, and we talked about do be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your anger, nor let it give a foothold to the devil. So let's meet a man according to God's word that he was the meekest man on the earth. But there was times when he allowed his anger to get out of hand. Let's go to Exodus chapter 2. And we'll read verses 11 through 15. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, and he went out into his brothers and looked on their burdens, and he spied on Egyptian, smiting an Hebrew, one of his brothers. And he looked this way and that way, when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian, hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him, That did the wrong. He said to him, That did the wrong. Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? Where is the fellow that you smite with him? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me, and thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh. And well in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Now, here's a question. If you still got your Bibles open, what was the cause of Moses' anger, according to what Brother Bobby just read? What was the cause of his anger? He had killed the... But what caused him to kill? Him. Yeah, what was the cause of his actions to kill? Okay. So Moses saw the injustice of the what Israelites being what perpetrated by the Egyptians, right? Now Moses is a Hebrew by birth, <clears throat> but he grew up in the house of Pharaoh's daughter. She was the one who pitched him out of the lake when there was a decree by the Pharaoh to kill all male Hebrew boys. And so they put a little pitch tent together, basket together, and they taught it with pitch, and they placed Moses along the Nile River. And while Pharaoh's daughter was out there bathing, she, saw, she heard a baby crying and had the servant girl to what? Fetch the little basket out and discover there was a, a baby. She gave him his name, Moses, which means I drew him out of the water. That's what Moses' name means. I drew him out of the water. And so now Moses grows up as an Egyptian, he don't, even though he's a what? A Jew. But he, he, he grows up as an Egyptian. Now keep in mind that the Egyptians 
have enslaved the Hebrews, which is Moses' people. Moses is about maybe 40 years of age at this time. And he goes out into what the work community, the work environment, and he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. That brought about Moses' anger. He saw injustice. They, there was a time where they was making them what, especially when Moses came back, they were making what bricks without straw. But this time they were hard labor. They had been in hard labor for over 400 years. And Moses saw the injustice of how the Egyptians were treating his fellow Hebrew brethren. <clears throat> now, just because Moses grew up in the White House, it did not mean that he did not love his people. Y'all know how it is when some people make it big, they try to forget where they come from, right? They, they knew they from the hood, <laughs> right? But they, 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 they done got a little money in their pocket now and act like they don't know where the hood is. Don't want to come back and invest in the hood or say hi to nobody. Well, Moses knew that he was from the hood. And he knew his people. And he says, why are you treating my, well, I can't say they my people, because I get my cover up. And the scripture says he saw this injustice day after day, and Moses got so angry that he killed somebody. Now, he had a right to be angry because of the injustice. But the Bible says, but don't let what anger control you. Well, Moses did not control his anger. The scripture says he looked this way, he looked that way, and one preacher said he should have looked up. <laughs> He looked this way and he looked that way, saw that the cover was clear, and he killed an Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Well, the next day, Moses see two of his homies mistreating each other. He back in the hood. <laughs> and he said, man, why y'all mistreating each other? That, that's a good question, ain't it? Have you ever saw how we treat each other in the hood? How we gunning each other down? Because I got on red, you got on blue. This is my corner. What you doing on my turf? Why you selling dope in my hood? And we gunning each other down. Right? He said, why y'all hurting each other? And he said, man, well, that ain't none of your business. Who made you a prince over us? You going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian yesterday? See, he was found out, wasn't he? And then he had to flee. See, Moses thought the Bible, the book of Hebrews says Moses thought that was an opportunity for him to the people to realize that God was going to use him to rescue the people, but it wasn't in God's timing. Now, 40 years later, now he's 80 years old, God said, now Moses, I've heard the cry of my people in Egypt, and I'm sending you back to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses said, what you talking about, God? Right? I'm not the man. Well, you thought you was a man 40 years ago when you tried to what? Do it all by yourself. Moses had an anger problem. Let's look at another example of Moses' anger problem. Let's go to Numbers chapter 20. Now, you may not resort to killing people when you get angry with them. Not, not so physically with what Moses did, but look at another occasion where Moses allowed his anger to get the best of him again. Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. Miriam. Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people continued with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord, why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness? that we and our animals should die here. And why 
God have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of gain, grain, or feed, or vines, or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went, went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brothers, Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak into the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah. Meribah. Because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hollowed among them. Thank you, sis. So here's another situation in the life of Moses. Now, keep in mind that Moses is the pastor of a mega church, as we would say. He has millions of people that God has allowed him to lead out of Egyptian slavery. They had been there for 400 years, generation after generation, and they're on their way to the promised land. But they get to points in their journey to where they, they lack uh, the daily necessity of food and drink, right? <clears throat> the scripture says here they come to um, the wilderness of Zen in the first month. So they've been in the wilderness for, for a month now. They've been free for a month now. They don't know what freedom is like because they've been slaves all their lives. They finally get some freedom. And the people stay in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, who is Miriam? Y'all know who Miriam is? Sister. Moses' sister. Moses' sister was the one which, when she saw Pharaoh's uh, daughter bathing and they drew the little basket out of the water and baby Moses was in it. It was Miriam who says, can I go get you a, what, a Hebrew woman to nurse this baby for you? That was Miriam. Now, Miriam, uh, from time from time, Miriam and Aaron. Aaron is the oldest. You also have what Miriam. So Moses is the baby in the, in the family. He's the baby. His sister dies. And the scripture says they come to a point in this um, journey, a month after leaving Egypt, they had no water. For the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. They gathered together against them. Now they didn't come to them, they gathered against them. <clears throat> now there's a right way to approach leadership. <laughs> right? If there's an issue with leadership, you may can we have a talk? But you you don't come already with an agenda to gather against your leadership. The scripture said they gathered together. Against Moses. Now, and now who is Aaron? Moses' his brother, right? So remember when God told Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, and he said, well, I can't speak. And God says, well, your brother Aaron, he's coming out to meet you. He will be the voice for you. You tell Aaron what to say. I'll tell you what to say, and you tell Aaron what to say before what Pharaoh. And so... Now the whole congregation gathers against Moses and Aaron and the people contended with Moses and spoke saying, if only we had died when our brethren 
died before the Lord. In other words, I, I wish we would have died in that rebellion that Korah led. Y'all know that Korah led a rebellion and God caused the ground to open up and swallow them. This is the mindset of these people. They said, we wish we had a died when Korah died. Not me. <laughs> I don't want to anger God so bad to where he opens up the ground and swallow me up. But when people are so contentious, they don't even think about what they're saying. They said, we wish we had a died in the rebellion that Korah died in, right? And look at what he said. And why have you brought us this assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? Why have you brought us up? Who brought them up there, brothers and sisters? Who? The Lord had brought them up. God was directing Moses. And so they had taken their eyes off of God and they said, well, why have you brought us up, the Lord's people, into this wilderness? We ain't got no what? Water to drink. Our animals ain't got nothing to drink. And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? This evil place. Now we were clapping and dancing and shouting in Exodus chapter what, 14 when God opened up the Red Sea <laughs> and we were getting our praise on. Yeah. But now, a month later, this is an evil place that God has allowed you to lead us to. <clears throat> is it not a place of grain or figs and vines and pomegranates? Nor is there any water to drink? Their minds went back to Egypt. That's where the plum granites and the figs and all that were. But guess what also was in Egypt? Slavery. Uh-huh, in slavery. They, they had the palm granites and they had the figs. They were also in slavery. Have you... Do you always go back and talk about, ooh, the good old days? Boy, when I used to club, man, when I used to drink my old Milwaukee's in my Coke 45. Ooh. Yeah, my slip my Tell it, tell it, tell it. <laughs> but why do we always seem to think them the good old days? When we were getting drunk. Then no Christ. God done saved you and delivered you, and you'd still calling them the good old days. And they said the good old days were back in Egypt when we had all these palm graves and figs. Never mind the slavery. Never mind I can't go where I want to go. <laughs> Don't have no days off. Can't go visit my kids. Right? And so they called this place an evil place because they didn't have what they wanted to eat or drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle. See, that's before we retaliate, especially as leaders, we need to spend some time along with God. So God, you, you, you see the fickle that we're in? <laughs> These folks are blaming me for where you've led them. Y'all know that God will test you at every and then, right? Because this was nothing but a test. God was testing to see if they would trust him. But instead of allowing the test to have his perfect work so they would be mature and lacking nothing, they took it out on the leadership right. and said, you brought us out here, a place of no water, no food to drink. But the leadership fell on their faces before God. And then God gave them a plan. Then God spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, Gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Now, keep in mind, they're in a barren place with no water. God says, I'm going to point out a rock to you, and I'm going to perform a miracle in the desert by you speaking to a rock. Right? But y'all know sometimes, the burden of leadership is so heavy that we forget what God tells us to do 
and we take it out on y'all. God says, speak to the rock, raise the rod and speak to the rock and I'm going to work a miracle. I'm going to bring water from a rock. And Moses and Aaron left the presence of God and they gathered the whole congregation together. Now notice his tone changes. He's angry now, right? Because I'm tired of y'all complaining all the time. Right? Every time you get in a little jam, things don't go your way. You come running to me and Aaron. We ain't got no food. You done brought us out here to die. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. And most of y'all are just getting on my last. <laughs> yeah, he was angry. He was angry. And he called them rebels. You rebels. And he didn't say it nicely. I'm probably, I'm probably sure he said it like that. Because he's talking to multi-millions of people. And they had to hear him. You rebels! Must we bring water from this rock? And he, in anger, he struck the rock. But God wanted to get some glory from that situation. And God didn't get no glory. Right? And, and when we lose, when we don't do what God says the way God says it, God doesn't get glory. Right. Now it gets done. God still gave them water, but God didn't get any glory. Have you ever been in a service to where it becomes about you and not about God? Hmm. It, whether it may be in your teaching or in your preaching or in your singing, right? It starts off with God getting the glory, then you put your spin on it. <laughs> and you rob God of all of his glory because now you want to be the show that's what happened with Moses he got so angry he lost control and he called God's people rebels and he struck the rock and God said Moses come here again I need to talk to you again Moses and Aaron because you didn't do what I told you to do the way I told you to do it and I didn't get no glory, you're not going into the promised land with these people. And if you keep on reading the text, you'll discover that Aaron died. Well, Miriam just died, right? right. Aaron is the first high priest of the nation. He dies. And then God takes Moses up on Mount Nebo and he says, I want you to look at all the land that I promised yeah. the people. This is in Deuteronomy 34. When you get time, you can read it. He allows him to see all of the promised land. He said, but you won't go in, Moses, because you did not hollow my name in the midst of my people. God allowed him to see it. See, brothers and sisters, it doesn't do you any good if you have angry leaders. Right? The Bible tells us in the book of Thessalonians that you are to not to make the leadership of your church angry or, or resentful because it does you no good. That's what the word of God says. And so Moses got to a point in his life, he just allowed his anger to get the best of him. We see that two times here in the scriptures. And uh, he lost um, his um, temper, which disqualified him from leading God's people. And now Moses dies, God buries him, and now Joshua has to lead the people into the promised land. And so this is another example of uncontrolled anger. And we say is that do not let the sun go down on your anger, nor allow it to give foothold to the devil. And that's what we see here, that Moses allowed his anger to get the best of him. And he was disqualified for ministry. Yes, sir. In, in verse 13, my Bible says, This is the water of Meribah. Yes, sir. All the children of Israel strove with the Lord. Is there another? Mine says strove, but I'm not sure what strove means. Contention, what? quarreling. Oh, like it literally water. means contention or quarreling. Oh, okay. Meribah. Strove. The same name was used earlier at the first occasion of bringing water from the rock in Exodus chapter 17 verse 7 
So they they named that place in regards to what they did in that place, Meribah, which means contention or quarrel. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. So. The Shrove means they was arguing with Yes, sir. Oh, okay. They was contending with Moses and Aaron about having no water, oh, okay. having no food. Oh. Yes, sir. And God had them to name that place Meribah, which means contention or quarreling. Uh, because that's what they were doing. Every time they got into a bad spot and they didn't trust God, they went and started quarreling with the leadership. Okay. <laughs> we want to thank you tonight for coming out uh, for this um, Tuesday night Bible study. We will continue to uh, pick back up with Ephesians chapter 4, uh, moving with verse 26 all the way to verse 32. Lord's will on next Tuesday, we'll pick back up with this lesson. We want to invite you to come and join us uh, this coming Sunday is Father's Day. Uh, we invite all men to come and worship with us on that day. Uh, Sunday school starts at 10 o'clock. Morning worship starts at 11. Until that time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you as I pray.